All right, let's continue the conversation. With me right now is co-founder and executive director of Jobs to Move America, Madeline Janis. Madeline, it's good to see you. She's a national and multi-regional nonprofit strategic policy center that supports reinvesting taxpayer dollars to create good jobs and a fair and prosperous society. And we also have Dr. Tanya Matthews. She's the director of STEM Learning Innovation and associate provost for inclusive workforce development here at Wayne State University. Ladies, it's good to have both of you here with me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, why don't we first go ahead and start off, Madeline, if you could talk a little bit about what you're doing on a daily basis to move things forward. Sure. We're working on the idea that public uh, cities and states and the government agencies have an incredible opportunity to shape the future for workers in this country. We spend about $2 trillion a year on buying things. 12% of GDP are cities and states and the federal government. We invest huge amounts of money in subsidizing uh, for job creation purposes. And we are subsidizing all kinds of corporations that are maybe not doing the right thing for this country. Um, we need to start bringing up those issues and demanding that we actually take the taxpayer's interest and working people's interest in mind and uh, do our best with policy and with developing a worker voice to shape the future for workers. Have you found that there are corporations that are, are open to this kind of change and open to changing the culture that they have? I find that when workers are strongly organized, when public sector, when cities say, we're going to put criteria in our bidding documents, when we are going to condition the subsidies on these things, then companies become more reasonable and actually are willing to say, OK, what kind of retraining do we need? What kind of disclosure do we need? What, you know, How do we need to commit to good jobs and equity for women and people of color? They're willing to do that. But if government changes and resets the table, that's possible. If companies are basing everything, their decisions on bottom line for shareholders and what's going to make the most profit, in general, they're not inclined to spend more money or commit to more things. There have to be parameters in place to help nudge them along in that way or make it almost really worth their while. Tanya, you're on the front lines of making sure that people are trained for these jobs mm -hmm. of the futures and working with STEM. How have you seen um, our, I guess, our attitude towards STEM change in the last five years? Because you and I have talked about this a number of times. Yeah, I, th I think the attitude is becoming much more comfortable, right? Of course, universities have always been in the business of workforce development. And I think we went from STEM for some to some STEM for all. Understanding sort of the way that our society is going, you may be full force into the field, or you're going to be using one of these high impact tools of STEM in your field. And so universities, um, and also our K through 12 programming, is shifting the way that we think through that. And I also notice parents um, and faculty becoming much more comfortable with the idea that these are things that can be taught, these are things that can be learned. And I'm also still very excited that we are um, placing some of the other skill sets, the critical thinking skill sets, the collaborative work uh, orientation skill sets on the same level with algebra. Uh, which in the, the way that we're working and the way that companies and the economy is growing, that's actually what needs to happen. And education needs to support that. And it's truly important. I mean, when we have our kids coming up and, and they're asking them all the time, I have a 15 year old who's a sophomore in high school. And just this morning, they did an hour of on a computer program asking, putting you know, their likes and dislikes into a computer and then spitting out what career would be good for them. And uh, it's a little difficult to wrap your head around um, that it goes in a computer and then it, it, it sort of spits out. But once people feel that they have the educational tools or they have um, the education that will help them with these jobs of the future, then they might feel that they have a little bit more power in the workplace to be able to articulate what the company should be able to do and that the workers should have really more, more of a part in that. Have you seen that people feel more empowered once they are part of the new skill set that employers seem to be really valuing? I think that people are feeling more value. And as Madeline said, it's also about giving workers and students choices and giving them power to understand that they do have choices. So I prefer when the software spits out, this may be your first career. Okay. Um, in, in terms of understanding that we will be transitioning, the challenge right now for workforce development, for university, for K through 12, is to prepare prepare folks for anything, not for everything, but for anything, right? Because these jobs are having a, a life cycle and we need to be prepared now as a matter of course. Do you want to pick up on that? 
Well, I just want to pick up on the the survey because that's kind of alarming that your daughter is getting that kind of survey. When I first started doing uh, work around the industrial economy, uh, when you know people say women are not able to do you know to build things or to be part of kind of building the new technology of the future, and I would and it, it, it's pretty alarming because mm -hmm. I think you know part of what we're ingrained what's ingrained into our head as as women as young women is that we're not able to do that work and so when you just ask what your likes and dislikes are you know you're going to get you're going to get something spit out at you that maybe doesn't reflect your knowledge and understanding of all the options for example when i first started we did a project on women we called it women can build and we did and uh, we took photographs of the new rosie the riveters and I would go around asking young women, where would you rather work? In a Walmart um, for minimum wage or in a factory where you could have career path training and you could have a good job and benefits? And a lot of the young women said Walmart because that's the only thing they could see themselves doing. And, and, and Tanya, this harkens back to a conversation that we've yeah. had about the STEMinista program that mm -hmm. you've had encouraging young yes. women to see themselves in careers that maybe that they have not mm -hmm. seen possible before Absolutely. Or, or have not had their interested interests kind of pushed in that way and said, look, this is something that you could do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. Um, and I definitely um, resonate with the, well, be careful when you ask an eight-year-old what he, she would like to do when they grow up. But I think that throwing in all kinds of options, right? I think a lot of this is the messages that we're getting and the images that we're seeing. This is why role modeling is important. This is why actually diversity in the workforce is important for now and for the future. Madeline makes a very, very good point in terms of students and workers see themselves in folks who are already in those spaces. So while we currently need to diversify our workforce because we're having innovation challenges that monolithic group thinking cannot fix, we also need to think about that in terms of engaging and invigorating the pipeline from all kinds of perspectives. Um, I am big on telling young ladies who would like to do hair when they grow up that they need a chemistry, chemical engineering degree for that because, uh, you know, there's lots of chemistry you get involved. that color wrong and no one's by the happen. time they figure out they had another route they've already at least sort of got that in in their ecosystem and i think it works across gender it also works across socioeconomic status uh, first generation college students or first generation new work sector uh, employees so i think thinking ab about the way we communicate um, and the way we um, set folks up for taking multiple options and multiple opportunities is, is critical. All right, ladies, we're gonna have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining me.